morning or good afternoon wherever you are in the nation. Uh, it would be my pleasure to share with you uh, the finding of uh, three studies that we did for or on the local lo road bridges. I would like to thank uh, uh, my, my, my colleague, Dr. Webby and our graduate students who worked on this project, uh, Lucas Bone, uh, Zach Carnan, Michael Mingo, and Alexandre Bripon, which without their help, we could not finish the project. Uh, today in this presentation, which is a summary of three research projects totaling around half a million, I will try to answer four main questions. And question number one is, what are the common bridge types on South Dakota local roads? And how to load rate a damaged double T bridge or a bridge in uh, basic general? How to rehabilitate the longitudinal joints if they are not performing well? And what would be the best alternative that has been proved, tested, and good to be used on local uh, uh, roads? Uh, again, I would like to thank our sponsors, or main main sponsors for South Dakota Department of Transportation and Mountain Plains Consortium, which is another uh, or basically a regional UTC center, and uh, many industry partners. Again, without their help, we could not finish these projects. So I would really appreciate uh, their their direct support. Let's let's talk about our first question. What is the common type of bridge on South Dakota local roads? And the answer is double T. Double T is not the only one that is used here in this state. I've seen also it has been used in other 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 states extensively on the local road. Uh, in the South Dakota, we have more than 700 of those in service. And what we have found that uh, is 75% of those double T bridges are 20 years old or older. So that's the time that we need to figure out what to do if they are damaged. And then other finding of these studies was uh, we've seen the structural detailing, aging and cold condition weathering and bad detailing also uh, changes how they perform and how uh, the uh, live load capacity of these bridges will change. Here is actually one, one actually example. One, com one common uh, damage reported for double T bridges is the reflective, is the reflective uh, basically cracks between the girders. Here is one actually photograph. You can see one girder A and B and you can see a continuous uh, and long cracks along the length of the bridge. And uh, Dr. Webby tested uh, a 40 feet uh, double T bridge using conventional joint that is currently used in, in the practice. He applied vertical force using actuators on one of the girders and pushed it down. And what was found that the joint is not sufficient and cannot transfer to load from one to another. And here is another proof uh, that these joints are not structurally viable. Uh, here in this slide, the chart shows a uh, deload versus deflection of the bridge. And what is obvious here is the force deformation of the two girders are not consistent. And one gear there, the loaded one got all of the loads and another one did not. So that one shows that the joint is not structurally sufficient. And the other factor we have found that is if you use the conventional joint, you cannot meet the ASHTO requirements. So, 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 so what was found is uh, conventional double T longitudinal joints are not sufficient and we need to find a way to, to fix them. He, here are actually uh, other types of damage that has been uh, reported. And you can see cover deterioration, you can see exposed tendons, you can see deterioration of the concrete at the end of the girder, 
and you can see also water leak underneath of the joint as well. So many types of damage, then the main question will be if you have these damages, how you are going to evaluate a bridge or double T bridge with those. So that one, uh, that one actually uh, basically raises these questions, how to evaluate damaged double T bridges. Uh, to answer this question, we field tested two double T bridges. We also perform strength testing of two 45 year old double T girders. And we also carried out an extensive analytical study to find what's uh, the effect of damage on the capacity. And we also proposed a methodology to road, load rate double T bridges. Now I'm going to very quickly talk about each of those uh, bullets. Uh, first was the field testing that we performed. Uh, we inspected 10 bridges in South Dakota. That was in 2018. And uh, we, we picked two bridges to perform the field testing. And uh, those that we picked were 34 and 38 years old at the time that the test was uh, performed. And one was 42 feet long and another bridge was 50 feet long. The reason that we picked these two br bridges for field testing was uh, the damage in the gear there to gear their joints. Here you can see the stain and color change from most likely the corrosion of the steel plate in the joint. Here in this picture, you can see the stains from the water leak and the bridge has other types of damage, but these were the main reasons that we picked these bridges. Unfortunately, we did not find any bridge with more severe longitudinal joint damage. So we tried to understand how the load between the girders will be transferred with, with the worst case scenario that we could find. And the way that we performed the testing was uh, we used a dump truck and we loaded uh, with 50 kips. We performed both static and dynamic tests. The static tests were carried, um, were carried out by having a truck speed of five miles per hour and dynamic test was initially we take 55 miles per hour, but because of the local road condition, the gravel condition and the safety of the crew, we actually reduced the speed from 55 miles per hour to 35. That's how we perform our dynamic um, testing. I also want to mention that the depths of the gear there in one of the bridges was 23 inch and depths of another uh, gear there in the second bridge was uh, 30 inch. These are the typical depths that are common for double T bridges in South Dakota. Here's actually a video of a dynamic test that was performed. So essentially the truck passes the bridge and the bridge was heavily instrumented uh, with strain transducers and we try to understand how load will be transferred. Here in this chart or in this slide, you can see uh, gear uh, distribution, uh, basic factors for the moment. And the graph is just uh, a graphical uh, presentation of what you can see in the table. What we have here is the gear there number uh, versus the gear there distribution factor. What we what was found that uh, the current ASHTO method is sufficient to be able to estimate how the live load will be distributed between the gear there's when the joints are damaged. We, we call the damage condition state B. I'll talk about it uh, short. But long story short, if your uh, damage is like the those two pictures that I actually showed, then you can conservatively use ASHTO to estimate the gear there distribution factor. We did the same thing for another bridge, same conclusion was, uh, uh, was, was seen or actually observed. And we also did for the shear and same conclusion again was seen there as well. 
so, so whenever the joint is damaged with condition state three, we have four condition state. One is uh, good, no damage, and four is the worst case like scenario. For longitudinal joint, if the condition state is three, uh, you can use ASHTO. And we also perform basically strength testing on two old double T bridges. We inspected bridges and the girders that we picked were heavily damaged. Here we can see a picture of the mid span of the bridge. Longitudinal joints were exposed, concrete were gone. We brought these, these girders to lab and uh, we tested them to failure to see how much or uh, what's the effect of these kinds of damage on the capacity of the girders. Here is the video of uh, the 50 feet long, 45 year old bridge. And that's the one that had damage at the middle span. So the bridge failed in a brittle manner, which we don't like. And uh, here in this, this slow motion, you can see how the slab failed first and then the gear there completely collapsed. You can also see the reaction of my student back there. So we post-processed data on what was found as, uh, this slide shows force versus deflection at the middle span of the bridge. And we also put, put the ASHTO limit of strength there. As you can see, uh, the force deformation or the capacity of the bridge was not enough to meet any of the ash told them at the state. So this 45 year old bridge or actually girder with the damage that I showed at the, at the middle span is definitely not sufficient, not safe and had to be replaced, which was done. But, but my point is how we can now estimate the capacity uh, having all of those damages. So we develop based on the lesson that we learned, we develop a technique to estimate uh, the capacity of damaged double T bridges. And at the end, we did a recommendation on how to load rate or actually evaluate a damaged double T bridge. Uh, discussing how to load rate double T bridges, uh, the equation that you can see here has three, three components, uh, the capacity component, uh, dead load and live load component. We cannot touch uh, the dead load component. However, based on the lessons that we learn, you can update and adjust live load component, for example, to calculate the girder distribution factor when the condition state is three, uh, you can use ASHTO and then if the condition state is four, you, you have to go with the biggest of the factors of exterior, interior, and 0.6. So based on the test that we perform, you can uh, update the live load component. You can do the same thing for the damage. And what was recommended is you need to know what's the capacity of undamaged um, gear their moment and shear factors and then updated or adjusted based on the damage that you will observe. For example, if uh, the stem cover deterioration has a condition state of four, the moment capacity won't change. However, the shear capacity will go down by 25%. So you can practice this and update the shear and moment capacities and update the uh, the 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 uh, uh, load load like rating equation. So that's how how uh, we propose to evaluate old the old and damaged double T bridges. Even though the method or technique was only for double T, you may use it for other types of uh, open precast or post engine bridges as well. So that one ends up to the basically second question I had. We have bridges that the longitudinal joints might be damaged, how we are going to fix them? To answer this question, uh, we uh, developed 20 rehabilitation alternatives and we uh, tested 13 large scale beams, we performed finite element analysis 
And then we tested the 40 feet long conventional, then rehabilitated and like retested. And then we provided like recommendation on how to rehabilitate joints. These days, UHPC is hot topic. And if you go to any concrete related conference, you will hear all trial high performance or a UHPC. And what essentially it is, it's a fiber reinforcement tissues concrete and made with very fine aggregate and 2% usually volumetric steel fibers. And uh, here is the difference between UHPC and ordinary concrete. Here we have compressive strength versus strain. You can see that UHPC has five times higher compressive strength and usually five times higher ductility than conventional concrete. So it would be a good uh, option or material for rehabilitation or retrofit purpose. And here is the tensile property of UHPC as well. Or, or technique to rehabilitate the longitudinal joints of double T bridges uh, was, was, was to develop finally two connection types. One was to expose the joint and bars and fill it with UHPC. We used in the testing phase a latex modified concrete. We call that continuous detailing or have pockets with the shear key to connect those and we call that pocket detailing and you can feel it with UHBC. So in both cases, the technique is to saw cut the joint, uh, get rid of the bad concrete and expose the, uh, the, the deck, deck egg reinforcement and add the new reinforcement and fill it with UHBC or latex modified concrete. We, we found that latex was not the best option because of the constrained region. Uh, latex showed the, basically uh, water leak, so it was not the best option for durability purpose. So our recommendation is just to use UHPC. And here is how we tested, fatigue tested the bridge. I hope you can see it. The actuator here pushed the bridge down. We did it for half a million times. And when the bridge was like rehabilitated, we did the same thing to make sure or understand if the gear, if the loads will be transferred between the girders when they are rehabilitated. And here is a result of the fatigue testing. As you can see, the stiffness, the overall stiffness of the bridge when the number of loads increased did not change and it means that the joint is performed well and uh, we did not see any kind of damage uh, using the, uh, the alternatives that were basically proposed. And here is the, fatigue, uh, the ultimate testing of the bridge uh, with the rehabilitated joints. Uh, that one was like a strength testing or goal was to fail the bridge, see if the loads will be transferred between the two egg girders. Uh, the, the, the bridge failed at uh, 10 inches of deflection in a ductile manner. So the result was uh, very good. And uh, what was found here in the next slide, you can see the damage of the bridge at the failure of the girder. Uh, the girder failed at the top flange uh, by, the, by the failure of the concrete. However, the failure was ductile. You can see a large, large crack at the middle span of the bridge. Here is the overall condition of the bridge. And here is the UHPC joints. As you can see, uh, at the failure of the gear there, there were only a few hairline basically cracks on the joint, meaning that the joint did its job hold the two girders, transfer the loads between the two girders, and the uh, girder itself failed, not the joint. So the proposed rehabilitation method was viable. Same structural performance for the latex, but because of durability issues, we are going to say only use UHPC. And here is the behavior of the two girders, uh, tested girder A and B, loaded and unloaded. And you can see that the behavior is more or less the same, meaning that the load was transferred between the two girders and joint performed as 
uh, it was intended. And we also did a cost estimate. The pocket rehabilitation method will cost you around 30% of the bridge replacement and the continuous joint cost you around 60% of the bridge replacement. And here is our final detailing. If you would like to rehabilitate the double T using the pocket connections, uh, this is the final detailing that you need to follow. And we would like, uh, uh, we, we talked about load rating and we also talked about rehabilitation of double T bridges. Uh, but the question is, if none of those work, how about if we want to replace a bridge? What other options that we have? And is there any proof tested options? And that's what we did here. We performed literature review. We found 10 alternatives that could be used for local road bridges. And we tested uh, three full scale bridges to failure to prove their performance at 50 feet long, fully precast bridge, 50 feet long girder timber bridge, and, and 16 and a half long slab timber bridge. And we provided recommendation at the, at the end. I'm going to very briefly touch each of those, the constructions first, and then the results of the testing in the next, in the next the portion of the presentation. So here is the, uh, uh, the, the, the test specimen for the precast bridge. Uh, for local roads, a two lane and two shoulder bridge is very common. And the span lengths between 40 and 60 feet is very common too. So we assume the 50 feet long, 35 uh, feet wide bridge as the prototype model. We use two interior girders of the bridge uh, for testing. The test specimen was full scale consisting of 250 feet pre-stressed inverted double T girders, uh, inverted uh, T girders, five precast panels, each 10 feet long. On one side of the bridge, we use hidden pockets. You can see that in this basically figure, we put a cover on top of the pocket. And then other side of the bridge, we use open pocket. We, we also use uh, head at the start and inverted U-shaped bars uh, to connect the panels to the girders. And for the panel-to-panel uh, uh, -panel connection, we use female-to-female -female joints and we, post, uh, we, we, we put uh, both transverse and longitudinal bars in the joint. And at the end, we filled the joints with, with a conventional uh, concrete and also latex modified concrete as well. Here is the prototype uh, timber girder bridge, which was 50 feet long and 35 feet wide. And then we also have the prototype uh, slab timber bridge as well. And these will, these will be a good options for local roads with low uh, traffic, uh, which are usually used on the farms or to connect the local roads. Uh, let's talk about the, uh, the, the, the uh, test specimen of the timber bridges that we did and the issue that we found there. The test bridge was a full scale consisting of three interior girders and 13 panels. We asked the manufacturer to provide or give us uh, basically basically southern yellow pine with the grade of 24F. However, by mistake, they provided a lower grade. And uh, I'll talk about what was the effect of that in, in the performance of the bridge. They did the same actual mistake for the slab bridge, but at the time we knew that the material was wrong. So we changed the testing uh, span lengths from 20 feet to 16 and a half to make sure that the bridge will, will, likely, will likely survive. So there was a mistake during construction by the manufacturer and they used a lower um, basically grade of wood uh, during the construction. Uh, to construct the uh, uh, precast bridge, uh, we put the uh, 
we see gear there side by side. Then we put panels from one side to another side. And uh, we also did not use any shoring. We used strut and tie to basically avoid the shoring on a local road. If that's over the bridge, you don't, over the water, you don't want have the shoring that would increase the cost. And we used the joints with, with, actually, with the ground. Uh, that was done by graduate students who were not uh, uh, experienced laborers. The process was very simple and like, efficient and we were able to put the bridge in the lab in one or two days and an experienced contractor will do that much faster. And here is the uh, uh, basically bird's eye view of the precast girder bridge before testing. The bridge was tested in three phases. In phase one, the actuator was placed at the center of the bridge with a half a million cycles of loading, uh, uh, basically conforming to actual fatigue two loads. And uh, for the another one, we changed how the load will be directly transferred to the joints where the panels were. And we did 100,000 cycle of ashto fatigue two in that case as well. And here is the construction of the glue lamp uh, uh, bridge. Uh, we put the girders first and then uh, we put the cross braces and we use epoxy to connect uh, the timber decks to the girders. And here is the view of the test specimen. 50 feet long and kind and 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 nine and nine point three feet wide. All of the bridges that we tested were to cover at least one lane of uh, traffic. And here is the test specimen for the uh, slab timber bridge. And to be able to connect the two panels that we had, we used uh, stiffeners underneath of the bridge and we bolted those stiffeners to the uh, decks to make uh, the entire deck, deck a uniform. And here I have a video or two videos of how we perform the testing on the timber bridge. Timber is a soft material, so you can see a large deflection here. And here in this one, you can see how the fatigue testing was done on the precast concrete bridge. You cannot see the deflection, but you can see the reflection of the lights on the water dam. These water dams were to see if there's any leak on the joints. And based on the testing and post, post, post actually processing, let's talk about which of these options will be the best for the local roads. For the precast bridge, this graph shows the number of loads versus uh, bridge overall stiffness. After half a million of fatigue loading, the stiffness of the precast bridge remained the same. And that one means that there was no deterioration in the system compared to conventional double T, the ones that I showed earlier in the in the presentation, the conventional joint, this is a superior performance. We observed, uh, we observed some shrinkage cracks at uh, the joint, at the open joints filled with the latex. Then we concluded that we should not use open joints and we should not use like latex in this in this kind of the bridge. And we also saw some, some actually shrinkage cracks here and our recommendation was to put some longitudinal bars in the haunch region to get the, uh, to actually control the shrinkage cracks in the haunch region as well. But overall the performance was satisfactory. We also performed strength testing on this bridge. You can see a load versus deflection response here and the bridge did not fail at three times uh, the ashto strength limit state and uh, we could not fail the bridge. So the bridge also met all of the ashto requirements under strength testing as well. In terms uh, of the performance for the glue lamp girder bridge under the fatigue loading, 
uh, we did not see any deterioration of uh, the, uh, the, uh, the stiffness. However, the way that the two panels were connected, we have seen some, some damage here uh, and all recommendation was to use flat end panel to panel joints. Do not make male female connection there. That should get rid of uh, this kind of damage. This kind of damage did not, however, change the overall stiffness of the bridge. And we also found that if you want to design a timber girder bridge, you have to assume uh, a fully non-composite condition or strain profile, the major strain profile clearly showed that the strain at the bottom or at the top of the girder and bottom of uh, the panel are not compatible. So we have to assume, or it's safer to assume that uh, strain is not compatible and we have to go with uh, fully non-composite uh, behavior to design the girder itself. Here is the way or failure of uh, timber bridge. And uh, here is a picture of the damage as you can see at the basically failure of the timber bridge. There was the laminations of the layers of the glue lamb and uh, And that's how, how, how two of the girders of the three uh, failed for the timber uh, girder bridge. Uh, for the slab bridge, we performed same, same, same kind of a study. We did not see any kind of damage on the joints and all likely we saw after half a million cycles of testing, it was the natural or uh, uh, panel to panel joints, uh, the gap between the two were expanded. So overall, this bridge performed very well under the fatigue testing and under the strength uh, testing, uh, the, 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 the glue lamp girder bridge, as we discussed earlier, we used a, a, a wrong grade of the material. The force deflection response of the glue lamp girder bridge uh, is shown in this slide here. The bridge did not meet the Ashto strength limit state requirements because the as-built girder constitute material was weaker as I discussed earlier and uh, was not what we specified. And the bridge girder were designed assuming a partial composite action. Again, our testing showed that you, you, do, you, you should not do that. And uh, we, we actually recalculated using the correct assumption based on the testing findings. And we were, uh, we were able to recalculate or estimate the right capacity of the material. So long story short is if you design girder timber bridges with right assumptions, you should be able to use Ashto and accurately estimate the capacity of timber girder bridges as well. For uh, the, uh, the Guru Lam Islab bridge, uh, we tried to fail the bridge. It did not fail at the three times of uh, the Ashto strength of the state. Bridge met all of the Ashto requirements and we did not see any major damage anywhere. So this is another alternative that you can use for short to span uh, uh, Roads. So here is actually a summary of the three alternatives that we tested and uh, or, or a recommendation is to use glue lamb slab bridge when you have very short spans up to 30 feet. If you want to use the glue lamb girder bridge, they would be valid between or would be best between 30 up to 70 feet. Uh, and precast girders usually work better for longer spans. And in terms of the cost estimate, the glue lamb slab bridge will cost you 50% less than double T's. The glue lamb girder bridge will cost you about 15% lower than double T's. And precast uh, full depth deck panel bridges will cost you around 10% higher than double T's. So now you have three more options 
uh, to use on local load bridges. And uh, let's let's put all of these three studies together and talk about uh, the answers of the four uh, questions that I raised earlier in the presentation, uh, or double T is the most kind of uh, is 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 the uh, bridge type that is mostly used in South Dakota on a local roads. Load rating should be performed on damaged double T bridges and you can use the methodology that we propose by updating the live load and uh, the capacity component of the bridge. UHPC field uh, pocket connection is the best to rehabilitate longitudinal joints of double T bridges, even though we haven't tried or tested this for other types of um, precast girders, but it might be a suitable option for those, let's say if you have a box, uh, box a girder, uh, and if their joints are not well, you might be able to use UHPC field pocket connection to rehabilitate those as well. And now we have three new bridge alternatives to, to a replaced uh, old or damaged double T bridges. Uh, as I said like, earlier, this was a short summary of three research that we perform. Uh, you can find, if you're interested, the full report of these studies on the uh, Mountain Plains Consortium website. 